Namaste Swamiji, this is regarding Bhakti Yoga Gita chapter 12. Lord Krishna responds to Arjuna that those who worship him are as dear as those who pursue the formless Brahman. In fact, they reach him quicker if sincere. Then why should we take the harder route through Jnana Yoga? The path of knowledge. <laughs> so, yes, in the 12th chapter, Arjuna asks Sri Krishna, those who seek the formless Brahman and those who worship you in your personal form, which of them is a better yogi? Which of, which of them is superior? And Sri Krishna quite clearly says that those who follow the path of bhakti, devotion to devotion to God, a personal God, their path is easier. Why is it better? It's easier. Why is it easier? He says the path of the formless is difficult for those who are embodied. The exact words are Abhyaktam hi gati dukha deha vadhi ravapyate. The unmanifest, the formless existence, consciousness, bliss. It's difficult to realize for those who it says deha vat, the ones who have bodies are embodied. Now everybody is embodied. Krishna is embodied. What does it mean? For those whose body consciousness is very strong, who cannot seem to see themselves as apart from the body, who are very body oriented, for them, a devotional aspect, you know, God as a bigger body, <laughs> God as a personal, uh, as an object, yeah. instead of the consciousness which is the pure subject, can I put this consciousness as an object? It, is, it can never be an object, but I can imagine it to be an object. I can attribute to it a form, a name, um, qualities, all loving, all good, omniscient, omnipresent, the God of religion. And then I can worship. That's also a valid path. And that's actually much easier for most people. But that does not mean that uh, the path of knowledge, if it was basically impossible for most people, then Krishna would not teach it. The first thing he taught Arjuna in second chapter, first thing he taught was directly the path of knowledge, that you are the Atman, what we were talking about here. If you find that difficult, then the path of devotion. For some, this one works, for some, the other one works. So, and in this age, a lot of people, if you have an inquiring mind, if you have a rational, it, it has to make sense to you before you take it up. Uh, it has to be in consonance with rationality, with science, with logic. Otherwise, your mind, just intellect just doesn't permit you to walk down that path. Then the path of knowledge is for you. If faith comes easily to you and all this seems rather boring and dry and impersonal, then walk down the path of faith. Vivekananda's answer was good. All of them. You have a heart to feel and love. Why will you not love? Direct love to God and especially God in all beings. Love. Swami Vivekananda recommended it very strongly. The path of love is very powerful. Certainly more powerful than all other paths. But you also have an intellect to understand. Yeah. Swami Vivekananda said, a man must not only have faith but must have intellectual faith too. Your intellect must assent to it. Yes. This feels right. This looks real to me. Otherwise, if your intellect does not assent to it, if you listen to uh, Christopher Hitchens and da Daniel Dennett and um, Dawkins and say, yeah, that guy sounds right. And then all your devotion and uh, love, you will see the spirit behind it gets sucked out. The intellect cannot inspire, but it can say no. It can tell you that it's uh, it, it can stop you from uh, doing something. Emotion and faith are the engine which propels you forward in any, any endeavor, not just spiritual life. But if the intellect does not allow you, if the intellect says it's superstition, it's just a matter of belief, it's a belief system, then imagine a path of devotion is, it's not that it's really easy, today you have some faith and you do a little puja and listen to a bhajan, tomorrow you'll be enlightened, no. It's also very, very difficult. It requires a lifetime commitment, complete surrender and devotion to God. That will not be possible if your intellect obstructs it. If your intellect says that it's just 
some belief. So, yes, this is the answer. Do all of it. We in the Ramakrishna order, we have the harmony of the four yogas. We do this Vedanta, what you are doing? Absolutely, this is our fundamental philosophy. Sri Ramakrishna said in our order, he said, um, keep the knowledge, the yesterday I mentioned it, the knowledge of Advaita tied to the hem of your cloth and then do whatever you like. Keep this in the background, then you can worship God. You can love God and worship God. Now the advantage will be what you know that what you are worshipping is real. You can meditate on God, you can serve God through good works. The Holy Mother, Ma Sharada, to a response to a question, she said and sent a reply. She said, I can say with conviction that you are Tumra Adhoitobadi, that you are non-dualists. And yet you practice service and devotion and meditation, all of that. You saw the structure of sadhana, Jnana Yoga, Upasana, Karma Yoga. So that is a structure accepted by classical uh, Advaita Vedanta. If you go to the Shankaracharyas in Sringeri, they will tell you that. It does not exclude Bhakti. In fact, if you go to Sringeri or some other uh, Shankara Mata, you will see throughout the day only rituals are going on. From morning till evening. <coughs> yeah. Is it against Advaita? Not at all. Not at all. All right. In fact, I just want to say one thing, very quickly. I've said it at other times, but this is, it's good to know this. Our whole study here, the five verses, they can be boiled down to the four Mahavakyas, the great statements. So just take the typical Mahavakya, Tattvamasi, that thou art. That thou art. What does that stand for? Remember, this is from the Chandogya Upanishad. So, in all of these, all of these Mahavakyas, they all express the identity of the Jiva and Brahman. You are Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi, Pragyanam Brahma, I am Atma Brahma. All of them mean the same thing. And in all these sentences, you will find these two. Which two? That and Tvam. And there will be something which, which expresses their equivalence, their identity. All the Mahavakyas have this structure. Now this is very deep. All of spiritual life can be understood in this way. See, broadly speaking, spiritual life, our spiritual quest, the religions of the world, they are of these two kinds. These two kinds. One is a that-centered religion. That here means God. Brahman, Ishwara. And the other one is a Tao-centric. Not self-centered, that's a bad way of putting it. Self-inquiry based religion. So God and the self. Think about Christianity, Judaism, Islam and the devotional sects of Hinduism, Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktaism. What is Christianity about? God and Jesus Christ. That centered. It's about devotion, love, surrender. What's, what's Judaism about? Jehovah, the, the Lord. Islam is about uh, Allah. What's the central thing in Islam? God. So God centered um, in Vaishnavism. It's about Krishna or about Vishnu or Narayana or in the Shaiva approach. It's about Shiva, the Lord Shiva or the Divine Mother in Shaktaism, uh, Durga or Kali in whichever form. So it's all about God. And there is uh, the methods in those religions will be uh, you will see it will be about, it will be devotional, bhakti, love, prayer. There will be temples and churches and mosques. There will be prayer and music. And yes, often the festivals, a lot of food <laughs> and then whatever. So it's a devotional approach. Now, is there any other kind of religion? Religion seems to be that. That's why in the West, the name for religion is faith. But what we did in the last two days, it doesn't seem like faith. It's, uh, it's something much more than faith, it's understanding. There is another form of religion. 
which is the self inquiry based religion where God is n either not there at all or marginal example Buddhism example Jainism example in the Hindu tradition Sankhya and Yoga in Sankhya God is not mentioned in Yoga God is mentioned but only as an as an aid the goal is not to reach God in, in yoga philosophy the goal is to realize yourself as the witness consciousness and be free of nature Prakriti Purusha have to be separated God helps you there that's it but you're not supposed to reach God be one with God or go to heaven no 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 um, Buddhism God is not mentioned at all Jainism God is not mentioned at all that's not the purpose in the uh, it's inquiry into what am I and that will lead you to Freedom, Nirvana, Kaivalya, whatever the term used, freedom. In these religions, the self-enquiry based religions, you will find they are generally more meditative. Meditation, variety of meditation techniques. They are generally more intellectual, based on study. They are generally more monastic, generally I am saying. You see Buddhism, Jainism, Sankhya Yoga, these are monastic or ascetic, mostly, more. The emphasis is not so much on big temples as on meditation halls and monasteries and all of that. So there's this difference. One is centered on love and devotion to God. Another one is based on inquiry within. Each has advantages and disadvantages. Each has advantages and disadvantages. Even in our personal life, even in our personal spiritual quest, if you ask, you will fall into this category or that category, usually. Some people. I've asked young people becoming monks in the main monastery in, in India. I used to ask them, why are you becoming, what are you looking for, what are you seeking? Many of them said, I'm looking for God. I'm searching for God, God realization. Others said, well, God is good. I have no problems with God. But who am I? What am I? I'm searching, search, looking for self-realization. It two mentalities. When you ask, is that uh, path of devotion, isn't it better? It may come very naturally to this group. It will not be very motivating to that other group. So it depends on your mental makeup. So, so even in your personal life, some belong to this group, some belong. You, if you ask yourself, you will clearly see an answer. Often many people who come to Advaita retreats, they belong to this group. They are more self-inquiry based. Who am I? What am I? Yes. Can you be both? Yes, certainly. You can be both. Both appeal to you. And that's good. Both appeal to you. Notice that I have not yet mentioned Advaita here. Where does it fall? <laughs> you can clearly see it talks about both. Yeah. Anyway, now both of these approaches have their advantages and disadvantages. What is the disadvantage, the great disadvantage of the God-based approach? The great disadvantage is it's based on faith. It begins with faith and proceeds with faith for a very long time. Unless you are like Ramakrishna having vis visions of Kali all the time. Until that point it's entirely based on faith. And it can be attacked and shaken. You are looking for something outside. For which there seems to be only some kind of textual reference and few people talk about it. And the whole world seems to be against this thing. Today in our modern materialistic world. Belief in God doesn't come easily. Lip service comes easily. People go to temples and churches all the time. Are you, do you seriously believe in God? To the extent of searching for God and giving up everything else, very few people have that kind. That's, that's a real faith. That's real deep seeking. So that, that's difficult. And especially when it's attacked in the name of science, in the name of logic and philosophy and religion, the philosophy of religion attacks it. Richard Dawkins was the great... You've heard of Richard Dawkins? In recently his book... Uh, what was it? The God Delusion. He's well known for his the selfish gene. Uh, one of his early books. So he was an evolutionary biologist in Cambridge or Ox Oxford. Oxford. He's in Oxford. So he's a militant atheist. He, he, he called. He, call, he in fact advocates what is called militant atheism. Not only I'm atheist, but I'll go around. If you ad, you people are a nice target for him, right? <laughs> you believe in God. Now he'll aggressively attack you. Why do you believe in God? You should not believe in God. So somebody interviewed him and said that atheists are only a tiny percentage of the world population. Less than 1%. At one time China and so Soviet Union were classified as atheists, so percentage was bigger. But now, so less than 1% are 
actually it is. 99.9% are some religion they believe in, um, in some ways. So he said yes, he gave a very nice answer. He said yes, that is true. But if you take the population of scientists, um, <coughs> you know the most tr well trained, smart people, you find the number of people believing in God drops up very sharply. And then he gave an uh, example of a, of a poll among Nobel Prize winners. They were sur uh, surveyed, those living Nobel Prize winners now. And it turned out more than 80% of them are atheists. 80 to 90% of them. What is the conclusion? The dumber you are, the more likely you are to believe in God. The smarter you are, the less likely you are to believe in God. And that's the statistics. Now you decide. <laughs> right? So this is the problem with the the advantage of the God-centered God religion is God, if God exists. God has no problems at all. God is uh, infinite and uh, omnipotent, omniscient. God is problem-free, entirely problem-free. God is, um, is one very happy person, <laughs> personal God, if God exists. That's the only problem. All right, so advantage, disadvantage is clear. This approach, the self-inquiry based approach, has its advantages and disadvantages. First of all, advantage. There is no problem of faith here. I exist. Nobody doubts that. <coughs> Even the Buddhist. The Buddhist does not doubt that some self exists in some form. Not in the form which the Hindus say, an eternal, unchanging self. They will say that. But there is a, an experience of a self. Yes, it's composed of a stream of momentary consciousness instants. But still, that's the nature of the self. In, in some sense, I exist. Nobody ever doubts it. What am I is open to doubt. But I exist in some form, nobody doubts it. So it is not, the question of faith never comes, you know. Many people in the West who d are disillusioned with the God-centered religions, they turn to Buddhism. In this country, for example. Why? Why? Because Buddhism doesn't ask you to believe in something else. You are there. Do you seriously doubt it? No. Then investigate it. I'll give you the series of meditation techniques, mindfulness and so on. We will see. So that is the advantage of the self-inquiry based religion. There is no question of doubt. There is no problem there. But what is the problem, that disadvantage of that? I have no doubt that I exist. But that existence is the problem. I am surrounded by so many problems. I have ill health, financial problems, relationship problems, parking problems and so on. <laughs> parking problem not here. Arizona, a lot of parking space. <laughs> In Manhattan. I have endless problems. My existence is sure, but it's a limited, miserable existence. And there's death in front of me. Old age and death is there. So it's a limited, miserable existence. God's existence is unlimited, glorious existence, but doubtful. <laughs> Uncertain. This is the advantage and disadvantage of, of the two sides. All right. Why am I saying all of this? What Advaita does is, it says that thou art. This approach is also correct, that approach is also correct. What you will find by this devotional approach to God at the very end of it, if you succeed, is exactly what you find by the self-inquiry based approach. You re reach the same reality. A Sufi mystic said, when I searched for Allah, I found myself. When I searched for myself, I found Allah. I can't, I can't state it any better than that. Very beautiful. When you are searching for that reality, the reality of this God, the one consciousness which is in all beings, from the meanest animal to the highest gods, the one reality behind them. And the one reality which you find lighting up your own mind and senses and body. It's the same reality. We just read it now. I am Atma Brahma. We just read it now. Mm. What Advaita Vedanta says is, what you find by this method is what you find by that, that approach. It is one and the same reality. What is the advantage of the Advaitic approach? Now watch the magic. What Advaita does is, it combines the certainty of this approach with the infinitude of that approach. What you are talking about in Advaita, this Atman, Brahman, is it there or not? Are you there? Can you doubt that you are there? No. You are there. Now I will show you this certain existence about yourself, which you are certain of. You know you are there. This certain existence, I will show you, this is the unlimited God. 
That's what Advaita does. What did we do? In the waking, dreaming, deep sleep, the analysis of seer and seen, five sheets, all of that. What are we doing? We are taking up you and then removing your limit- limitations. We show that the, the undoubted consciousness within each of us is the unlimited consciousness behind the universe. So, there is no doubt to this, this path. Um, the infinitude of the, that approach and the certainty of this approach, they are they're shown to be identical. So this is a very interesting aspect. An enlightened friend tells me to stop coming to seminars as I already know uh, the, the truth. Just please respond. No, don't, don't stop coming to seminars. <laughs> Why? Two things. Good for your enlightened friend, but as long as I do not feel that certainty, I must keep seeking. Not just seminars, but I must keep meditating and praying and inquiring, doing my daily spiritual practices, communing with like-minded people like this, going to good places which inspires me, adds to me. As a seeker, this is very helpful, one. And then, suppose you are enlightened, you already, as your friend says, you already know the truth. Then what does this seminar do? It enables you to assimilate, to stay with it. This is called Nididhyasana. In another word for it is Jnana Nishtha. Nishtha means um, dedication to staying with it, assimilating it, soaking it in. You already know. Suppose you already know all this. Very good. In Uttarakhand I have seen sadhus who know this Vedanta teaching through and through. Much better than maybe the young teacher who is sitting on the podium and teaching. But the old Swami will come and sit and open the book on the, the Upanishads and commentary, maybe for the nth time in his life. He never says, I've read the book, now return it to the library. No, no, no. I have seen among, one, one of our teachers used to tell us, you don't read, you all, the young bra- brahmacharis and novices, you flip. <laughs> <laughs> what is reading? He said, you go and see, there was a Swami, Shikshanandaji. His name was one who takes delight in education. <laughs> Shiksha. No, the shiksh, that's, that uh, shiksha means it comes from the Vedic Taittiriya Upanishad shiksha. Anyway, you go and see him. He used to teach at one time. He teach the novices in the training center at one time. <coughs> but when we saw him, he was, you, know, you can say retired. He was old and ill. He was in his, he, there's a small room. He used to stay there. So whenever, whenever I have seen him, I used to go down and bow down to him. and He would always be reading. But reading what? Reading the same Upanishads, which he had been reading for 60 years maybe. So they will always be open before him, Upanishads with the commentary of Shankara, and he's reading. And if you go down and bow, bow to, down to him, he'll just look up and go back there again. <laughs> what is he doing? It's not that he's gathering new information. It's not even that his, um, his understanding is becoming deeper. No, no, no. That's already done, long time ago. It's just like a mirror showing him the face of God. It's just telling him the truth which he knows. And it's reflected back in the book. It's, it's uh, especially delightful. It's very easy. It's like a spiritual practice. It's like meditation. It is meditation. It's a form of Nididhyasana, Vedantic meditation. Sri Ramakrishna saw this uh, yogi in Dakshineshwar who came and who would daily read a book with great attention. And one day he saw what is written in that book, which he read daily for hours together. Throughout the book, what was written? Rama. Rama. Only Rama. And he's reading that with great attention. Hmm. Is he getting information? No. Getting new arguments and logic? No. Already something is real to him. He's just focused there. So this Swami who passed away decades ago, um, I remember... He had cancer of the liver. And the doctor said it's very painful. But he did not take any medication. He wanted to give up the body. And uh, till the very end, he was very clear. It's just the body. I am the Atman. There's nothing wrong with me. 
And the young monk who attended to him in his last days, he told me, I would try to persuade the Swami, just eat a little more, um, eat a little, he would be bedridden. He said, don't worry about me, I am perfectly alright, I am the Atman. He said, no, I don't want to hear that I am the Atman. Eat with this mouth, I want you to eat this, <laughs> this food with this mouth. And um, he passed away that way, in, in very, in serenity and calmness and completely undeflected by the undoubted suffering of the body. So do keep coming. Before enlightenment, after an enlightenment. <laughs> Why does, or oh, this is related, why does a person of realization need to assimilate it? How is it done? Need to assimilate it? Alright, this is one thing I forgot to mention. The, the practice in Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge, is Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. You hear these truths, these teachings, contemplate them and meditate upon them. That should lead to enlightenment, realization that I am Brahman. Now each of these stages has its purpose. When you hear these truths, study these truths, you have the book, you heard the teaching, so this is going on, this is the first stage. At the, this stage is over when you can say, I know the teachings now. So I have paid attention, I have taken the notes, I have got it all clear, I know the teachings. Then your first stage is over. But then what is the problem? Two problems. Um, the problems are, the impossibility problem and the contrary tendencies problem. In Sanskrit, uh, vipari, asambhavana, viparita bhavana. Asambhavana, impossibility problem. Viparita bhavana, contrary tendencies problem. What is asambhavana? I have heard the teachings, um, but I don't get it. I have many doubts. How am I Brahman? And what do you mean Brahman is existence, consciousness, bliss? So, I have many doubts about it. So that stage, these, this impossibility problem, this can be solved by the second stage, mananam, thinking over it. You think over it, many texts are there which raise many questions and answer those questions. Ask the teacher what we are doing now, this is mananam, this session is mananam. This is the second stage in Jnana Yoga. This stage, when is this stage over? When you can say that not only do I know the teaching, but now it's clear. I get it. First stage, I know the teaching, I don't get it. Second stage, I know the teaching, I know what's there in Manisha Panchakam, and I get it. It's clear to me. I have no more doubts about it. I get it, I'm convinced. I understand what you said and I'm convinced. Then what, what could be the problem? There's something called contrary tendencies. You will still feel it's, it's an intellectual conviction. It's not really working in my day-to-day -day life. I still have suffering and what you promised, fulfillment, 10 to the power, 10, 20 or something like that. None of that, not even one is coming to me. <laughs> so all sorts of problems are there. Why? Because the body and mind has a kind of patterns of behavior and thinking which are ingrained. Behaving and thinking as if I am the body-mind. And that co continues to lead to reactions and, and trouble. So that has to be erased and reprogrammed. The new knowledge which you have got, you must dwell with that knowledge. You must stay with it. And that's where meditation helps. That is called Vedantic meditation. With eyes closed, with eyes open. It's a nirantaram vimrishatam, without any gaps, continuously dwelling on nityam brahman, eternal brahman, I am brahman. Not like a mantra, I am brahman, I am brahman, I am brahman. No, in various ways, you see. When I'm perceiving something, ah, in me the light of consciousness, all of this is appearing. When there is unhappiness, misery, physical pain, or somebody says something, then you see that in me the consciousness, which is absolutely pure and unaffected, this thing has come. It was there, not there earlier, it's there now, this unpleasantness, it will go away a little while later. Can I see that I'm free of the suffering now? Can you overcome? So if you can overcome suffering with this knowledge, that, that effort is called Nididhyasana. And that helps to assimilate. I like that idea of marinating and in cooking. Once you have finished cooking, you don't take it, the pot of the stove immediately. You put the lid on it and let it simmer. Let it soak, marinate. The spices get absorbed. So what you have studied, what you have understood, marinate in it for a while. It could be days, weeks, months. 
until it becomes absolutely clear then you should be able to claim at the end of the third stage I not only know the teaching I'm not only convinced about it it's real it's a fact you should be able to say like that this cactus this thing out there is it a fact we'll say yeah it's a fact why I can see it this body which I'm seeing is it a fact yeah I see it I feel it. it's a fact my senses and the mind and the thoughts is it a fact yes though you cannot experience it I can experience my own thoughts those are also facts the awareness which I'm feeling in the mind is it a fact look inside yeah I feel aware that's a fact this unlimited consciousness beyond the mind and the body is it a fact uh, it is a fact you're not noticing it if we had time we would we could do those exercises you would begin to see what is meant by that so that you should be able to say it's a fact it's real and it's helping me to overcome suffering it's giving me unending flow of satisfaction peace serenity then it is complete this is called assimilation Vivekananda said tell yourself again and again tell yourself means not like a mantra see it again and again I am that till it tingles with every drop of your blood that's his language you, you, you see it just like I am convinced effortlessly I am this body I should be convinced effortlessly I am not the body I am the witness consciousness unlimited eternal witness consciousness Purnam complete I don't need anything there about the first chart where does suffering fit how do we manage pain and suffering from our human experience in this world first chart you meant the chart about um, the sadhana the spiritual practice <coughs> this one or the one after this this one here this one he means this one uh, she means this one yeah so all happiness and ple uh, pleasure and pain are here in the mind pleasure pain they're all chitta vritti something that you experience in the mind isn't it when you're in deep sleep do you exp experience pleasure or pain no any suffering is experienced in deep sleep no only when the mind is active whether in waking and dreaming we can suffer so these are experiences in the mind they are movements in the mind vrittis how does spirituality help us to um, deal with it when you realize you are not the mind the movements in the mind pleasurable and painful you are equally the one which shines upon illumines them and gives them existence also the word used here was purti the shining forth you are the shining forth in this body and mind the body can be ill which leads to pain the mind can be disappointed frustrated that's also pain but if you're not the body and mind just as the pain or the frustration of another person is seen at a distance you will see this one also as a thing then you will not be affected when you realize that you are this what happens amazingly in the mind also the negative vrittis they also automatically calm down we suffer because we embrace the mind and body too tightly so every modification there gives me suffering when I see I am not it it can do its thing it can go old and grace uh, age gracefully and suffer maybe have diseases recover health and finally die it is nothing to me I'm not it then suffering is tackled Pranam Swamiji uh, it is said that the subtle body is devoid of consciousness how then is it possible for the subtle body to seek out another body and work out its vasanas? Two questions here. Is the subtle body devoid of consciousness? Yes, it's an object. But remember, it borrows consciousness from Atman. I'll ask you, is the moon devoid of light? Yes. Some are saying yes, some are saying no. no. Really speaking, no. no. But practically, practically, whenever you see the moon, the only reason you see it is because it's shining in light. Yes its light is borrowed from the Sun but practically it's shining when you look at your mind right now 
it's not a theoretical question subtle body we are using a fancy term for what you all of us we experiencing it we are experiencing it right now when you look into your own minds do you, don't you feel it sentient aware why the mind even the body feels aware sentient so where is it coming from the body borrows its consciousness from the sensory system the sensory system borrows its consciousness from the mind the mind borrows its consciousness from the reflected consciousness the reflected consciousness borrows its consciousness from brahman or pure consciousness pure consciousness borrows its consciousness from <laughs> no it doesn't borrow it it is consciousness itself it is consciousness itself right so the subtle body always has consciousness whenever it's functioning it has consciousness because it has it has reflected consciousness consciousness is shining on it it does not have consciousness of its own it's a thing um now the second question was how is it possible for the subtle body to seek out another body and work out its vasanas seek out and work out vasanas it doesn't really do that god provides for it we have no such experience of you know before birth i was i given a form to fill out i want these parents and i want <laughs> i want to be born here and i want these toys and gadgets at this age and this age no no option was given to me i had no idea and then i'm born here to these parents and this is what's going to happen to me all of it is produced by my past karma and if you say what guides the whole thing so vedanta will say um god ishwara in all the hindu systems one role given to god is karma dhyaksha the ruler of karma the dispenser of the results of karma but advaita vedanta adds footnote all of this don't take it too seriously <laughs> it's a story then what's real wake up brahman is real <laughs> everything on this side of brahman is a projection chin matra vistaritam we read it ah. brahme vaham i am brahman idam jagatya sakalam chin matra vistaritam this world what is this world world body senses mind reflected consciousness all of it is a projection is a dream of consciousness it's like a dream none of it here has any reality apart from this one our thing is just like a dream in a dream everything seems real except the dreamer who is nowhere in the scene <laughs> the dreamer is on the bed nicely dreaming nowhere in the dream but only that one is real and everything else in the dream is false it's a projection of the dreamer only consciousness is real consciousness means in this sense oh. what we mean by consciousness in our day to day language and in consciousness studies is this one okay what is, what is the relationship between this consciousness and the ego mm. where is the ego here it's a function of the mind good question what is the relationship of this and this where does this one relate to this one it relates to this one in this function in the ego ego is a function of the mind it's here again look at your own experience you just think i isn't it something in the mind i just think i yes it's in the mind what does it do vedanta defines it's a definition for the ego what is the ego ahankara abhiman atmika antakarana vritti the appropriating function of the mind is called ego which says i am this 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 happiness or um, say here desire for ice cream i will come and say i want ice cream <coughs> happiness i am happy so the i is an is the function of the mind which appropriates to itself or the functioning of the mind and the body i am this so consciousness what is the relationship of consciousness to the world this one body mind and the ego what's the relationship of brahman to this that's the question what relationship are they connected are they tied together is there physically some relationship which you can cut what is the relationship what is the relationship of the table and the wood they are the same thing the table is another name form and function of the wood 
Um, you can, can you say that the table is a shining forth, an expression of the wood? Can we say that? Yes. This world we are ex experiencing is an expression, a shining forth, a manifestation of Brahman. It is nothing other than Brahman. You still say, no, but what is the relationship between the shining forth and Brahman? The very nice answer was given by a monk in the Himalayas. Uh, this, this very question. This is, in Hindi he said, Bevkufi matra, only stupidity is the relationship. <laughs> there is no relationship. There is no relationship between Brahman, reality and imagination. What is the relationship between the real rope and the false snake? No relationship. What is the relationship between the desert and mirage water? No relationship. Shankaracharya says, the, all the water in a mirage is not enough to wet one grain of the desert sand. All the suffering and misery and terror in this world cannot affect you, the consciousness, one bit. But the opposite is not true. Without the desert, no mirage. Without the rope, no snake. Without Brahman, no universe. So it depends entirely on you. It is helpless without you. It cannot exist without you. It cannot shine forth without you. And you do not depend on it. You are not affected by it. But samsara is just the opposite. I am a tiny being in this vast universe. I am completely dependent on it. Any moment I might be snuffed out. Yeah? And I am so, I am full of suffering. And the little thing, if the universe deigns to give me a little happiness, I will be so happy. No, no, no. It's just the opposite. Then Swamiji, why is ego so bashed about in all... Because the ego... Is uh, oh, why is it bashed about in all uh, religious tradition? Yes, because there is a reason. This ego, which appropriates body and mind, it says, I am this. This is the point at which, if you say there is a relationship between the ultimate and the relative, between God and the world, this is the point at which it is related. This ego, as long as it is set in body and mind, samsara, jiva, suffering. This ego, when it refers to consciousness or Brahman, I am Brahman, when it refers to that. It's still in the mind. Its only function is pointing. It's just a thought in the mind. But what does it do? It points and appropriates. As long as it does the wrong thing by saying, I am this, it will suffer. Unhappiness will be the result. Why? This body will age and die one day. It will say, I am getting old. I am miserable. I am lonely. I am dying. Oh, I am dead. But no, I am not. <laughs> No, I'm not dead. How strange. <laughs> uh. So the reverse is not true. The I should refer to Brahman. That's what Vedanta is trying to do. Showing the I that you cannot be the body. The changing body, the object of the body, which is an insentient body. You cannot be the mind. You can only be this witness consciousness. Right ego. Right ego. Remember, even the right ego is a function of the mind. It's not you. You are trying to let go means you cannot let go. You must only refine the ego till it points to God. In a devotional setting, it will be, I am the servant of God or I am the child of God. Sri Ramakrishna says, that's the right ego. Or in a Vedantic setting, it will be, I am Brahman. That is letting go of the ego. But as long as the ego is tied to body and mind, you can't let go. Quickly, a few minutes. Alright, rapid fire round. Try to satisfy as many people as possible. Pranam Swamiji, thank you for saying... Okay, uh, would you be kind enough to give a glimpse of how you spend your day when not among devotees or people around you? That's a rare day. <laughs> But any monk of the Ramakrishna order, what we do or at least we are supposed to do is, is the four yogas. You are doing either karma yoga or jnana yoga or bhakti yoga or raja yoga. Either meditating or studying or serving. See all our activities, whether I am typing an email on the, on the uh, computer or talking to devotees, it's all part of my karma yoga. I am not supposed to do anything outside this circle. So this is what a monk does. And doesn't it get awfully boring? No, no, no. <laughs> oh. 
there's enough time for uh, fun, ice cream, and all. all. <laughs> there's, no, there's no problem at all. Namaste Swamiji, can one experience the divine Brahman while still in the body? What is the purpose of having a body? Is it to, is it to be born? Is it to burn out some uh, sanska, sanskaras? Can one experience the divine Brahman while still in the body? What else are you experiencing now? <laughs> Look at all the answers are there. Remember the cloud hiding the sun? Why would you think that the body obscures uh, the divine Brahman consciousness? Because it's like the cloud hiding the sun. It's like asking, when there's a cloud, can you still see the sun? Of course, you are seeing this cloud by the light of that very sun. The very experience, I'm still in the body, how can I experience Brahman? This very experience of being in the body, this is Brahman, the Brahman shining forth. It's like asking, while it is still a table, can you experience the wood? Or do you have to smash it? Then only it will be wood. What do we say? Touch? Touch wood. We don't say touch table. <laughs> touch wood. It is wood. Then, now oh, these seems to be long ones. On I am she, the Devi Matmam, um, Devi Suktam Rigveda, in which the Sadhaka declares her identity with, with Brahman. Yes. When I read, read that, it brings the thought of I am she and wonder that each one of us can attain this. Yet, l coming to this conclusion, how does one continue living in their day-to-day -day existence? What happens to the samsara that still awaits? The responsibilities that still remain. Yes, you can certainly uh, continue in your day-to-day -day existence. After knowing that you are, see an actor plays the role of a king, an actor plays, same actor plays the role of a beggar. Knowing all the while I'm not a king or a beggar, I am this actor. Does it prevent the actor from playing the role of the king or the beggar properly? No, not at all. The actor doesn't say, oh now I know, I'm an actor, I'm not a king. How can I now play the role of a king? Because you are an actor, you can play the role of the king. Yes. And samsara, the responsibilities, all of that can be handled much better. If you realize, I am not the body and mind. I am the infinite existence which cannot die. I am the consciousness which never fades away. The ananda is complete and full within me. I am that Ananda. Now, when I express myself in the world, all the duties and responsibilities, I can discharge them happily. Why do we grumble at responsibilities? Why does it feel like a weight? Because I feel I would be much happier if I were left to do my own thing. You know, If I were given enough money, trust fund baby, then I can do my own thing. Now I have bills to pay, I have a job to do and all of these things so boring. Not at all. Not at all. You have nothing to do. Remember, you as Atman, you have nothing to do. You have nothing to gain from this world. Whatever happens in this world is a consequence of past karmas performed in our unenlightened state. Play it out. Let it play out. Vivekananda said, let karma float it down. This body, let karma float it down. You don't have to commit suicide because you're enlightened. You don't have to run away to a mountain top because you're enlightened. You can continue to do. One Buddhist teacher said this very nicely, that um, um, after the ecstasy, the laundry. <laughs> after you get spiritual ecstasy, the laundry is still waiting, <laughs> which is the life still waiting. You have a house to maintain, a family, some financial responsibilities, health problems, all of that. Deal with it, deal with it calmly, serenely, knowing that it is nothing to you. It will go one way or the other. A sign will be at the, at when the end of this particular body comes, not your end, not my end. When the end of this particular body comes, when life is at an end in this particular play, we are not troubled by, Upanishad says, not troubled by, why did I not do that? Why did I do this? You are not troubled. It would have gone one way or the other from your infinite nature. It does not increase you, does not decrease you. 
Nothing that you do in this life will add one bit to your infinite glory. Nothing that you do in this life will subtract one bit from your infinite glory. Be at peace, then enjoy life. You enjoy life in serenity and joy. It says, full, out of your fullness. Not as one hunted. We are running through life like a person hunted. Time limit and there is a pack of dogs behind me to catch me. Disease, death, ru financial ruin, uh, family responsibilities chasing me. No. Alright. Uh, we have so many other good questions, unfortunately. We have no time for that. Um, but I rec recommend that we have a series in the New York Vedanta Society called Ask Swami. So many such questions come from all over the world. And those are selected. There's a team of people who select these questions and present it to me once in a month. That's not enough. It should be once in a week because so many questions. And people in the live audience also get to ask these questions. And those one hour programs, they are uploaded. I think already many are there. Yeah. Yeah. Many questions you will see which many of these questions are there. And they have been answered to some extent discussed. You will enjoy it. Now let me do a Shanti Mantra and invite Mangesh. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu I pray to the Lord that may this study be enlightening, may it light up our lives, may we proceed towards that grand enlightenment, Brahma Jnana, in this very life itself, and make ourselves and everybody around us blessed. Om, peace, peace, peace.